This program has been made possible by generous gifts from our friends of Cross the Bridge. Thank you for your support. He started the church at Corinth. He's been ministering there, but he's needed to go minister in other places. And in his absence, some people started gossiping about Paul, saying, well, he's not that, the, you know, he's not a, really a pastor. And some even saying he's not really a Christian and, and all sorts of things. And, and I can't, apparently, in some places, people talk about the pastor, I don't know, maybe, I think that's just in Corinth. used to be. 2,000 years ago, people did this. Um, I don't think they do it anymore. Not here. Not Kernersville. Not the bridge. Maybe first service, but not y'all. <laughs> so let's, let's jump in. And what I want to do is back up. Let's back up to verse 1 and kind of get a refresher. And I'll read through some of the new content, and we'll talk about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh, they were saying Paul was carnal. Paul was fleshly. He wasn't being spiritual. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of of Christ, and ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Paul is saying, look, I'm, I'm the pastor there, and if I need to punish disobedience, I will. That's not what I want to do, but I'm willing to do that. And verse 7, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? All of us, if we answered honestly, we would have to say yes to some degree. If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so, we are Christ. It's very strange to me that people who had been saved under Paul's ministry then turned around and said, Paul doesn't have a valid ministry. But they themselves were fruit of his ministry. As strange as that sounds, it happens. It, it's happened here. People who have been saved and discipled under this ministry then turn around and go, well, that's not a valid ministry. It doesn't have fruit. Well, then you go, well, then you're not saved. Oh, I'm saved, but you're fruit. I'm not fruit. They don't have any fruit. But you're saved. I'm, I, yeah, I'm saved. But... So, verse 8. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for your edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. Paul saying, yes, I've been given authority by God, and I want to use it to build you guys up. And I may need to tear some things down in order to build things up. Now, as we went through this, verse 5 is huge. It's one of those verses that I would encourage people to memorize, um, and it, it's huge because of the concept. It says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, because there's a battle going on. And part of the problem was these people didn't know they were in the middle of a battle. 
They thought this was just normal church stuff, and it wasn't. Paul's saying, man, there's, there's deep issues going on. We're fighting war. We're in warfare. And you got to understand that the moment you walk through the doors here, you engaged in warfare. This church is being used by God to reach people in our local community and around the world. It's being used by God to teach the word of God when so many other people are, are watering it down and not teaching at all. And so there's a spiritual battle going on. So understand that you're involved in a spiritual battle. The enemy in the parable of the sower, he's after the seed. And the seed is the word of God. So when you come in here and we begin to teach you the word of God, the enemy's like, oh, man, you know? I had him watching the game on Sunday. I had him at this other church that they never even opened the Bible. Everything was fine. I didn't mess with him there. There was no need to, but he's at the bridge. I got to do something. I got to get him out of there. So he keeps on there. He's going to hear. He's going to get saved. And they don't just get them saved there. They turn them in. They turn them against me. And they start training up soldiers. To, they, 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 not only, they not only take my people and make them Christians, but then they train them how to take other people from me. Amen. So you're engaged in about. Now, look, this whole thing of spiritual battles would be easy if on the battle days, you know, a horned creature popped up in your bed and said, hi, I'm Satan. I'm going to be really messing with you today. <laughs> and whenever you see me pop up, you'll know you're engaged in spiritual warfare. That's not what happens. Spiritual warfare takes place sometimes when you don't even know it's spiritual warfare. Sometimes if, if there's tension at the home, it's spiritual warfare. Somebody... Get saved, their spiritual warfare. Somebody gets baptized, their spiritual warfare. Somebody commits to serving, their spiritual warfare. And so there's tension. I mean, it's it's the, the, the guys that went to Oklahoma City. I guarantee there's spiritual warfare as soon as they started thinking, as soon as they started planning on going. And some of that warfare was from the house, you know. If, well, you know, the enemy came and said to the wife, well, he's leaving, not because he wants to go do something good. He just wants to get away from the house. <laughs> and then so the wife pops up, you just want to leave here, don't you? And he's like, what? I'm going to do something good. You're going to do something good because you hate me and you don't want to be here. <laughs> that was spiritual warfare. And some of them may have called home, hey, honey, I just called to, you know, say we're out here and Fine. You stay out there. You don't have to come home. That was spiritual warfare going on because ministry was happening. Now, notice the words, and I underlined them for you, casting down in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Or in the King James Version, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice that, imaginations, knowledge, thought, arguments, knowledge, thought. Where's the battle? A lot of it's here between the ears. It's not, some people assume other body parts are involved in the battles, but not, it's primarily the mind. Because this is where you begin to think, oh, wouldn't it be nice to do this? Or wouldn't it be nice to do that? Or I can't believe that's going on with him. Or begins to think weird things about people you love or people at home or people in your family. It begins up here. And if you... Don't keep your mind under control. It will literally run away with you. You'll be thinking all sorts of weird things. And hadn't you been in a place before where you were just 
mature. You, were, you just knew somebody was doing something or doing this. And you found out later you were just, you were dead wrong. See, your mind will spiral with you if you're just out of control. Let your thoughts run out of control because the enemy's going to interact and play with that. So be careful. Be careful. Don't let your mind run away with you about stuff. And that's the first battle strategy. Don't let your mind run away with you or with others. We're going to have these battle strategies, and please, I, please jot them down. They will, these will be some timeless things that you can use again and again and again. And if you jot them down and you have them on a piece of paper, then you've got them, and you can, you'll be amazed. That next week you'll be in a battle, and you'll go, oh, there's the answer. There's the strategy. This is what I need to do. I'm preparing you to be warriors to be soldiers and so you watch this thing and, and so they were getting upset with Paul why because these guys were running around talking about Paul they're running around going well I can't believe Paul's not here where is Paul what's he doing oh he doesn't care about you he doesn't well he must not he's not here when Paul loved them and started the church in Corinth so they begin to get upset and the spiritual battles were raging and the Lord wants us engaged in these battles and, and growing we read about it online watch it on television and hear about it on the radio our world is filled with violence and fear whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard our world is clearly broken and in need of hope that's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. Part of being a believer is we believe something that the world is at odds with, that Jesus Christ is and was the Son of God and came here to die for our sins, and we need to be forgiven. The, the world doesn't believe that. They're not teaching that. They're at odds with that. And yeah, there's some nice people out there. I'm not saying everybody out there is bad or evil or anything like that, but I'm saying there is a friction with people that say, hey, we just kind of appeared we weren't created. It was kind of from the goo to the zoo to you sort of thing. And, you know, you just kind of appeared. And then when you're gone, you're just gone. There's nothing after that. That's not what I believe. That's not what this book teaches. So we're at odds. I recognize that. I recognize we're at odds. So... We both should be at odds with that. And, and here's the thing. The Bible tells us. Jesus told us that. John told us that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. He says, so don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, as the world hates you. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Your attention, please. Notice what it says. It proves if we love other brothers and sisters, it proves we've passed from death to life. But the person who is the hater, that, that verse insinuates that they're not even saved. So if you look at a, a relationship and you see one person, you know, da -da 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 being hateful, being you know, saying nasty things, posting nasty things, whatever. And then you see the other person not responding 
in like manner, you know who's right. Because one person's walking in love and the other person is walking in poison. Now, God wants, he will allow us to get into positions where that love is tested. Because that's what happens in, with love. That's what happens in relationships. The test of a relationship is the love. And it's not the love when everything is going well. You know, and, and if you're married, it's not, you know, well, you know, when you're out at a nice restaurant having a nice dinner, you know, do you love your wife? That's easy. You know, do you love her when she's got a dirty look at you and, you know, yelling at you about something you have no idea what it's about? <laughs> do you love her at that moment? You're supposed to. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> That's what the Bible's talking about. That's what proves real love. And, and, and real love is not when we're in here together worshiping, oh, Jesus, Jesus, I love you, man, Jesus, Jesus, you know. It's when I pop and up, we're going to have a school. I have a school. I don't even remember a school. I don't even remember That's the proven ground when we start to disagree. See, submission is not submission when we're both agreeing on an issue. You find out if somebody is submitted when there's a disagreement. Here's a life lesson. In growth and maturity, unconditional love is the test. Even the unbeliever loves when all is going well. Let me say that again. In growth and maturity, unconditional love is the test. Even the unbeliever loves when all is going well. So that's the test, is if you have a disagreement or something or friction with somebody and you love them through that, that's real love. That's the real deal. You know, loving when it's, when it's messy, when there's a disagreement, when there's something going on. That's, you know... When in the heat of the battle is when you find out what kind of soldier the person is. You know, if a, if a, if you get into the heat of the battle and the soldier runs, that's not a good soldier. But you, there's a nice phrase for it that's a, a wall absent without leave. But there's another word they use for it: deserter. Somebody that runs in the heat of the battle when something they don't like happens or goes on. And again, that's where you get to prove your love. That's when you get to show your love. That's when, you know, you find out if you're loving God and loving people. And you get to show it here. God put us together as a church for you to express your love, for you to grow in love, knowing that you were going to be in relationships with some people that you just don't see eye to eye with. Now, our solution sometimes is, well, I just leave. No, that's not what God wants you to do. Some people say, oh, God wants me. You know, everybody, it's interesting. Some people... You know, people, churches, people come, people go. It happens. And as some people have left, you know, oh, the Lord told me to leave. And yeah, maybe some, maybe a few. Most, probably not. Because I see what a mess happens in their lives after they go. And, and also know that not everybody that leaves is going to church somewhere else. Some of them are falling out of fellowship. But they're not going to say that. They're not going to say, oh, well, look, my flesh is tired of him talking about my marriage. My, or my flesh is tired of him talking about money. My flesh is tired of him talking about the Bible. And I'm going to leave. I'm going to go backslide, so I'll see you later. Nobody's going to say that. They're gonna say, well, the Lord's telling me to go. But a soldier who's in the midst of the battle who takes off is not a good soldier. Now, the thing is, and, and 
God has us in this proving ground, in this training ground. Like the guys that went to Oklahoma City. They've been trained up. They've been equipped here to go minister to somewhere else and come back. So that's what God wants to do. He wants to equip you in this place. He wants to help you learn how to love in here. Because when we're in here, we agree about Jesus. We agree about God. We should agree about the Bible. Then we can go out and love on them. Because we've built that love and strengthened that love here. And, and you know, something else about churches, it, churches are like people. We're always changing. Yeah, some people, oh, the church has changed. Oh, not really. But what does that mean? What does that have to do with any? I mean, look, if you're, if, if you're in a battle and the sergeant says, get out of the foxhole, we're going to take that hill, you know. Well, but, but, but sergeant, we've never taken a hill before. We've always, fat, we've always fought on flatlands. I don't know about taking a hill. That's different. You've changed. What do you think our sergeant's going to do? Oh, you poor thing. We certainly have changed. No. Huh. He's going to do one of a couple of things. Either you're going to be court-martialed if he has the time, or you're going to go take the hill, or things are really tough. He's just going to shoot you. <laughs> Which I've been wondering the parallels between leading military and, and pastoring, and I don't know. I don't think that's an option for me, but, <laughs> but you know, churches continue. They, and, and, and that's the thing that we, we continue to change. We continue to grow. And I continue to see incredible growth in people. And that's, look, that's what I'm about. That's what we're about. I didn't start this thing to grow a big church. I started this thing to see Christians grow big. Amen? And so, you know, if, and if you think about, you know, people say, nah, 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 church has changed. Well, how? Well, it just has. Well, tell me how. And it just has changed. Well, that's, that, you can't, you know. I mean, think about the main things. And the main things are, you know, am, or, am I sharing the word? Am I teaching verse by verse? Am I, you know, am I sharing the gospel? All that stuff hasn't changed. Am I still raising up other men to teach? Check. Am I still sharing the gospel every Sunday morning and on every radio program? Check. Am I still sending out an email to encourage people to share the gospel? Check. Has that changed? Absolutely. It has. If you think about it, still raising up other men to teach? Yeah. And some of those men have been raised up into other ministries. Pastor Sean Bumpers, who did it right, as opposed to other situations, he, he went to uh, uh, Alabama, went to um, Birmingham and started a church. I'm on the board of that church. And praise God, there's a church down there because of raising up men. And not only have we raised up him, but we've got four assisting pastors here who lead men's group and speak to the men, speak up here, teach up here. We've got four assisting pastors. We've got elders to handle the word of God like a samurai handles a sword, man. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So, you know, are we raising up other people? Check. Has that changed? Yes, it has. It's gotten better. Are sending out an email. We still doing that? Yeah. Well, how's that going? Well, now instead of emailing a few people, we email over 46,000 people in over 50 countries around the world. <laughs> Praise God. And then, you know, um, so yeah. am I still sharing verse by verse, chapter by chapter? Check. Am I still sharing the gospel? Check. Has that changed? Yeah. There's more people getting saved. There's more people up front. There's more people calling in. There's more people getting saved. I mean, so changed? Yes. The same? Yes. There's things that aren't at odds. There's stuff that doesn't change, and there's stuff that stays the same. But, you know, are, do you realize that there are people that come to this church? There's two, three families, three families that were in the house that we're in the home Bible study that are still here. 
that there's dozens, there's over 100 people that are still here that came the first year that we started. Some of them in leadership, elders on the board, pastors who came in that first year that are still here. You think they've seen changes? <laughs> yeah. And a lot of those changes are because we've been responding to what God has done. But in the spiritual battle, sometimes we can get confused. And he wants us to get confused about any of that stuff. Friend, if you want to ask God to forgive you. And the reality is every one of us has something. When is the last time you asked God to forgive you? There's probably something that you need to ask forgiveness for. So whether you're up front or still seated or watching from somewhere else or listening from somewhere else, ask God to forgive you. Now can be when you lighten your load and put your burden down. Jesus said, come to me if you're heavy laden. Come to him right now and pray with me out loud. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me so that I could be forgiven. And I believe you were raised from the dead so that I could have new life. And I've done wrong things. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please fill me with your spirit and your love so I can follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. If you've prayed this prayer with Pastor David, receiving Jesus Christ for the first time or rededicating your life to the Lord, please call and let us know. We want to send you our exclusive First Steps package for free. This package will help you grow in your new life. Receive your First Steps package by calling 877-458-5508. That's 877-458-5508. Or visit us online at crossthebridge.com. We read about it online, watch it on television, and hear about it on the radio. Our world is filled with violence and fear. Whether it's threats of terrorism around the world or senseless violence in our own backyard, our world is clearly broken and in need of hope. That's why this month only, Cross the Bridge Ministries is offering Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism. This special presentation from David McGee was filmed on the anniversary of 9-11 and is a message of hope and victory. This insightful teaching also exposes the truth about Islam's dangerous past while rejoicing in God's plan for our future. Join David McGee as he helps you and your loved ones to walk in peace and not be afraid of what the future holds. The product Know Your Future, Be Immune to Terrorism is our gift to you for a donation of any amount to Cross the Bridge Ministries. Call today to receive your copy of Know Your Future by dialing 877-458-5508 or visit us online at crossthebridge.com.